Yeah. We're on. Cool. Russick Smith. Hi. Thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. Yeah, so you take um, your outdoor concerts to uh, another level. My A friend of mine sent me a vi- – uh, it was your – like that story about you from, I think, a Colorado TV station. Yeah, and, yeah, there was, uh, a, there was a TV station down in Denver that uh, did a story on me. Yeah, and yeah, he knows I'm always like climbing trees, and I have like a group of friends that goes out and climbs trees, and he's basically like, check this dude out. I'm like, oh, cool. So uh, it's like I'm going to have to get him on the show. <laughs> so uh, you, uh, you, you play a cello? up in trees what what made you do that the first time the first time uh it was an expansion i had already done some nature based performances and the reaction to them had been uh beyond my expectation the reason i i started sort of playing in natural spaces in non traditional um locations is because I I felt personally like I was in a little bit of a rut. I was feeling sort of cynical about um, just performance and, and a lot of stuff. And I thought back to myself, what is the emotion that I could use? What is it that I can do to counter cynicism? And the antithesis of cynicism, at least through my thinking was wonder, you know, creating these moments of wonder that would like make me feel like I hadn't experienced everything in, in the world. Like, Oh wow, this is really interesting. I haven't seen it all. And so I started doing these natural concerts um, to combat that in my own way. And then also, you know, hopefully to bring people along. Honestly, I just did it to sort of, you know, it's a fun way to like surprise people be like, Oh, wow. Beats jumping out from around the corner. Um, <laughs> so with, uh, with these, the nature concerts, it was just, um, they originally started with combating my own cynicism with wonder and that the reaction to those was, uh, beyond what I had expected. Um, far beyond what I expected. So it originally started with these uh, concerts in the middle of a river. And then I thought, what would be something else that would be neat to do? And so in Colorado, we have um, changing aspen groves. Um, There are these aspen. So aspens are all connected organisms and each grove is one unit. So when they change, they all change pretty much at the same time to this golden color. And uh, I, I took a tree stand out and posted up in one of these changing aspen groves and just kind of let people who are out enjoying the aspen leaves come upon that scene, you know? And, uh, yeah, again, that one, the, the reactions that I got from that were, uh, were really unprecedented. There was, uh, there was a, a woman actually, um, so after that first performance and, forgive me if this is a digression, but after that first performance, there was a woman who contacted me um, four months later. This was sort of out of the blue. She, she found my contact info or whatever. And um, she said, you know, my cancer has come back and my family, we, and I have decided not to fight it this time. But when I eventually pass, I'd like that performance to be, like what you're doing in the trees, I would like to be, to have that be the way my family remembers me. And uh, I mean, it, it, you know, something like that is, that's not the only time that a situation like that has happened. That was the first time it happened, but it's, it's really incredible to see how it affects people. Um, And I think in, in that unpretentious environment, you know, there's nothing that surrounds, there's no, there's no uh, concert hall, there's no tickets, there's no any of this other formalities that surround the performance. And I think as a result, people leave their expectations behind them and they say, oh, we're going to go see a cellist in a tree. Like, uh, what? <laughs> I don't know what that's going to be like, but we'll see. 
And so they're more open when they sit down, you know, they, they don't have any of those preconceived notions when they sit down to listen. And as a result, the music uh, seems to resonate at a deeper level. Um, I didn't, I don't know that I expected that when I first started doing these, I thought it was just a way to, you know, kind of, again, just combat that cynicism, but it's really taken off. Yeah, yeah that's, it's really interesting. So with the woman that had cancer, what, what did you do? What do you mean she, that's how she wanted to be remembered? What did you do a a concert for them or? Yeah, she, so what happened is she just, uh, she said, I don't know when I'm going to pass, but um, let's, can we, can we think of a place uh, to, to have a concert that my family and friends can come and see you and that will be my memorial service. Um, or my celebration of life. And so it really was just um, a performance. Like it was, you know, and, and she said, well, what, what would you want in compensation? I, and, you know, I said, I don't, I can't capitalize off of that. You know, that's not something. So there was one night, you know, I thought, I haven't heard from her in a while. Maybe I should get in contact with her and just see how things are going and you know how she's doing and everything and um but it was sort of later in the evening and the following day i actually got a con uh, call from her son that said that she had passed and so we sort of i think the next week um we had a, a her service on the shore of a lake wow that's that's pretty heavy like what's the I mean, obviously it's a memorial service, but like, what, what's that scene like? Like how many people are there and are they, like, are they like, are they like at a concert or are they at a memorial service? And then you're like, just like playing over there. You know what I mean? Are they like talking to each other or are they? No. So, um, we we came to the decision that just for the sake of accessibility um, for some of the friends and family, that doing it out on a trail would probably not be the most logistically reasonable. And so there was uh, the shore of a of a lake in Evergreen, um, and then I basically we had originally they had said oh you know, we'll have you, everybody will come down and sit in these chairs while you play or, and listen to you, you know, play some, they'll come down, listen. Uh, the son said he would say a few words, I'd play a song. And then her friend who was actually with her when they first saw me would say a few words and then I'd play and people would sort of depart. And it actually turned out, um, but it, it was focused around the performance, which, which was an incredible honor. I mean, to, to be able to serve, uh, to be able to serve a family and the deceased in that moment is a, is an incredible honor, uh, and it. So I ended up playing for probably forty five minutes, um, and I would put lots of breathing time in between each piece that I played so that if people needed to um, get up and leave or if they wanted to go, like it wasn't awkward. It wasn't like, oh, this is part of a concert. Mm -hmm. But it was probably one of the heaviest situations I've played because, you know, I was sitting there playing and the family is, you know, what, maybe seven feet away you know, probably 50 people or so, and everybody's grieving. And, and I'm just trying to act as a, a conduit, you know, in that moment. It's not about my performance. It's not about me. It's just about, you know, a conduit between the family and the deceased. It's, it's a really, it was a very, uh, it was a very moving moment to be a part of. I, I, I again, like I never would have expected to play that role, but it was, yeah, it was me as directly uh, the, the service, which was, which was, you know, very moving. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. And yeah, 
I would imagine that that is a pretty pretty heavy scene there, trying to like keep it together while you're. Um, did they like? Did they did she want like particular pieces played, or was it just like do your own thing, improv as you go, or? Yeah, it was my own music. Um, generally, when I perform, uh, the compositions that I perform are some of my own pre-written pieces, but also uh, improvisational and sort of um, trying to play appropriately for the moment in which I'm performing. And so she wanted just what I sort of embody as a musician, you know, tonally, there was no like set pieces. She said, what I saw in the forest that day moved me. And that's what, that's what I want to be the service. And, you know, I think that those perform that first one up in the Aspens was, um, I mean, that was largely improvised and probably with a few, you know, of my own compositions pre-written, but, largely improvised so yeah it was just I mean I think that there's a certain there are, I am not a traditional classical player um, and so I think that there's you know there are a lot of people who are really brilliant cellists um, who play you know very technically precision and, and they're great at classical music but that's as a player that's not me um, and so for, for myself, I just usually try and figure out what's right for the moment and play to that moment. And, uh, yeah, it, people always respond, you know, it, it always strikes a chord and that's, I mean, that's what I'm there to do just to play for the moment. Yeah. I would imagine like I was just thinking of like you, you playing up in the trees and maybe you're improvising or whatever, maybe the, the wind starts blowing harder, so you start playing harder or faster, and then the wind calms down, and you're like, is that kind of like what ends up happening sometimes, is you're uh, kind of like whatever the, like around you, or you hear like the, like is there something, like the stuff around you in, in, inspiring the, in, uh, improvisation is, is that the kind of stuff that happens and yeah certainly um, the trees I mean when the wind blows particularly in the trees the trees do move um, even and, and it's something that I think a lot of times if you're out in the forest and, and you feel a breeze and you're just kind of looking at eye level you don't see that sort of movement uh, in the trees but if you look up particularly in in smaller trees it, it of course depends on the tree but you can you can see a lot of movement in the canopy and that translates down through the rest of the trunk so when i'm up in the tree i definitely feel that swaying um <laughs> it, it's prev prevalent and so part of that is is interpreting those moments like you said with the wind blowing um with uh, the river performances that's uh in duet with the river you know the the water is constantly making a sound and so i i always like to tell audiences towards the end of the performance you know you don't you might not have realized it but the river is also making <laughs> its own small performance while i'm out here playing and so you know taking in the uh, the rhythmic and tonal qualities of each scene uh, is is something that I absolutely try and do. Um, I think it makes each moment and each location its own unique um, its own unique performance and its own unique song. Uh, it's only challenging when, say, uh, like a squirrel starts chirping and uh, it's out of time with what I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's been a challenge in the in the past, but it's kind of fun to try and like start to shape the music into that moment as well. <laughs> you ever had? Has there ever been a time where you think like the birds are singing along with you, or you think that like, does that like instead of you playing along to them, do you or have you ever felt like they're starting to play along to you? I I would I would, would like to believe so. I guess um, there's with the tree concerts. Um, usually, I'm I'm pretty much 
focused on what I'm, I'm doing and sometimes looking out, but I do know because people have mentioned, usually mention it, um, different occurrences. Um, I know in the river with the river. So I've had this long running performance series with those river concerts at the way festival in Breckenridge. And I do a set generally around eight o'clock and one around 10 o'clock. So one's sort of at the dusk in the evening and one is at night and the dusk at the dusk performance, all of the swallows come and they start swirling around the river. You know, they're looking for food. So it's, it's not all my doing, but um, yeah, they, there are all these birds down, down there. And then uh, the night performances, I know the bat, you can see, actually see the bats skimming the water. And I've had like, uh, like foxes come um, and like listen to those. So, I mean, I, when people mention that to me, cause usually that's sort of the stuff that, those are, are small details that I kind of will pass by me because I'm somewhat focused on playing. Um, but when people mention that to me or they'll show me a picture or a video or something, I, it makes me feel kind of like a Disney princess, you know, like <laughs> all, the, all the forest animals are here. <laughs> yeah. So you said you're not uh, like a, a typical kind of classical player, but um, did I read that you'd had classical training? Like you're... Yeah, so I, I started, I mean, cello isn't something that you generally get into without having a formal background in it. <laughs> There's, what I play now is not, um, is not like the traditional repertoire. Um, but when you start cello, you do have to have a, like, some real, someone to really guide you. Um, so I started when I was nine and had uh, private instruction from a, a woman named Barbara Thiel, who was my who was my cello teacher um, when I was a kid, and then uh, from cello, I kind of moved into uh, the electric bass and had uh, like learned a lot of jazz studies through the bass with a, a fantastic bassist named Matt Skellinger, who's still actually active um, and writing great music in Denver. Just a, one of the coolest musicians I know um but yeah when I was so I moved through those two things that classical foundation in cello and then I added in like the jazz aspect through through bass and I've added in a lot of instruments since then um but that is yeah there was like a formal foundation you know cello without having frets you know without having you know like keys with a piano that you can say ah, I, I press this key and it's a C Mm -hmm. it, it's very challenging it's it's very challenging to sort of pick up on your own so that's i don't i don't know any cellist who hasn't you know had someone that's kind of been there guiding them through <laughs> the process of learning it's a huge pain in the butt to learn i'm not gonna lie like i'm 23 years deep in cello and and you know i'm a constant student i'll never be i don't think i'll ever be as good as i want to be in my entire life I'll, i will always be progressing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good thing because if it's something that you could just like be like a like an easy video game or something like that, then it wouldn't be it would take a lot out of the fun out of it and the like. So it's like I, I play guitar, and so I, I I know what you mean by you can play for a long time and you're still just like there's so much to so so far to go yeah i think you're doing okay and then you watch stevie ray vaughn video and you're like okay well <laughs> back to back to work yeah. so I, at nine years old like why why the cello what why not um like what what made you pick the cello instead of you know like a guitar or something like that that's more common uh they have so they have um the no my parents aren't um, particularly uh, musical people. Um, my dad is a, likes music and he likes dancing, but he's not a player. My mom plays uh, like campfire tunes on the harmonica. Um, <laughs> basically, like she'll, she has this harmonica and she'll play it around the campfire when I was younger. Um, but I didn't have um, really the access to sort of um, instruments that were uh, like in the pop repertoire, like guitars or bass or drums or any of those sort of things. But um, I guess 
fourth, it would have been fourth grade. Um, usually schools will start kids on music programs there. And so in fourth grade, they had sort of an instrument petting zoo. Um, they have where kids will come and they have all the instruments set out around the cafeteria, you know, just like on the cafeteria tables. And the kids can walk around and pick them up and try and make noise out of them. And for me, um, I can still remember like which side of the cafeteria was on, um, but the cello was the cello was just big. It was like one of the biggest instruments that they had there. And no other kids were around it. They all sort of gravitate towards like the horns. Mm -hmm. And um, so, they just had like I just pulled the bow across the strings and uh it made noise and like there was nobody else there doing that. So that's really the reason why here, you know, a couple decades down the line, I'm I'm where I am now is because there was a thing that was big and there was nobody else there and it made noise. And so now <laughs> now I'm here. Yeah. When you're uh, carrying the cello up a tree, do you ever wish you, you took up the harmonica instead? I would imagine that's like a... Time, all the time. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I mean, like any sort of thing associated with travel, uh, with the cello, I constantly think about how I wish I had, you know, picked up like some more portable instrument. To, you know, I have added more portable instruments like uh, mandolins, mandola, concertina stuff that's easier to carry around so i'll take those around if i really want to bring an instrument with me mm -hmm. but um you know everybody knows me as a cellist and that's you know what my main performance scope is and so i have to take the cello um <laughs> but i i do <laughs> wish that i had a smaller instrument actually um so there's that bass sitting on the ground back there mm -hmm. that bass in particular i i uh, used to do uh I used to play bass for a, a polka band at the top of this mountain. And so um, this polka gig, which I really had a lot of fun with, you actually have to take two gondolas to get to. So you get your instruments, you put them on the gondola, ride up one, cross over the top of this one mountain, and then you take another gondola through this valley to the restaurant where the polka band would play this, this, uh, this fondue restaurant. And um, yeah, getting the bass onto those gondolas, like, you know, like the cello is kind of difficult, but it's no bass. Like the bass, that's the challenging one. One of those gondolas, you couldn't even, you had to fit it in diagonally. You know, the accordion player would climb in and then we'd put the bass in and then I'd step around over it onto one of the other seats and we'd ride. So it's uh, it's like second tier level of pain in the butt for, for transportation. But yeah, in the tree, I think, you know, I have a friend who's a bassist who's actually like, Hey, can we figure out how to get a bass up into the tree? I'd love to play with you sometime <laughs> up there. So maybe, you know, in the future, we'll see uh, a whole orchestra of tree musicians, all of us up there with, uh, with our own instruments. <laughs> yeah, I, I was looking for a video of, of how you climb the tree with it, but I didn't see anything. Like, so what's the process of, of getting it up? Because you're, you put your stand like 15 feet in the air. Is that... So yeah, between uh, usually I'm up about uh, ten or fifteen feet. Uh, anything more than that, it uh, it's just not visually appealing. So if somebody walks up to the tree, you know, within a good distance for the performance to be audible. If I'm up higher than ten or fifteen feet, they're mostly just seeing the bottoms of my shoes. Um, so it's not that like exciting. So ten or fifteen feet is kind of that sweet spot. And the way that I set up uh, everything is uh, I will rig the, the tree stand um, from which I play. I'll rig that using um, a sectional ladder uh, that I'll bring with me and then and a climbing harness. So I'll do all that rigging work, um, not in show clothes, not in like with any of that. And then while I'm up there, I actually attach, um, so I'll tie a rope around the trunk of the tree. It's actually the old four sheet um, from the Mystic Whaler. It's probably an inch and a half in diameter. So I, I'll attach that around the tree, strike the ladder. Um, so then when the performance, at performance time, I'll climb up the rope um, because the rope hides behind the tree. And then I'll either haul the cello up 
um, by another line that I have attached to it. Um, or if, you know, if it's appropriate, like someone will kind of like tiptoes hand it up to me. Um, it's a, it's a durable cello. It's, it's definitely my, my adventure cello. Um, so that one, uh, that's usually how I get up there. And part of the sort of magic, I think of the performances, particularly for people who just happen upon these instances is that they're like, well, how did he get up there? Mm-hmm. You know? So if the ladder is in the, in the visual, visual field, like it, it, you're like giving away the magic trick. And so part of it is like getting up there and being up there without people obviously seeing how that happens. And sometimes if, um, if I'm running with, uh, if I have other people who are, are helping me, you know, we won't rig the, the rope. We'll just rig the ladder, strike the ladder for the performance. It's sort of a more uh, streamlined method of performance, but yeah, um, a couple of ways. I like go, climbing up on the rope. It's always kind of like I put the bow in my teeth, you know, climb up there. It's always sort of showy to climb up here. Yeah. That yeah, that's pretty cool. So you mentioned the mystic whaler. So um, I saw on, on Facebook a picture of you uh, on on the mystic whaler. And uh, I thought, well, that's, that's pretty cool because I, I wasn't expecting that. I'm, I'm looking into you. And, there's there's usually something more to people than what the the obvious thing is like you play a cello in a tree and then but then but there's always like something else that's not always like front and center and and then so I saw that mm-hmm. thing about the mystic whaler so what what was that all about so the background of that is I used to so I went to school for recording engineering and I was working in uh some recording facilities around the Hudson Valley and around that time, I met somebody uh, who uh, knew the captain of the Mystic Whaler, John Edgington. And so he said, um, he said, you know, why don't you come and help out? And, you know, if you paint something and help us kind of like uprig the boat in the springtime, you'll, you know, you can sail down Long Island Sound and around Manhattan and all that. And so I said, oh, okay, yeah, that, I'll see what that's about. And um, so I went and did that and really felt like this super strong connection. You know, I was like, oh, wow. I, you know, I had never been on a boat that big. And to when a, you know, when like a, when a tall ship jibes, particularly with four and a half sails, um, it's, it seems if you don't know what's going on, it seems like a very, like something is going wrong. Cause you have these huge, essentially just trees with, they're just swinging across the top of your head. And uh, it was really thrilling. And, and I really felt the connection to it. And so when I eventually sort of, I started to like burn out, um, I started to burn out in recording and I decided, you know, I want to go do that. And the captain, uh, Captain Edgington had said to me, you know, if you ever want a job, just let me know. And so when I started to sort of feel like I needed to get outside of the studios, uh, I called them up and I said, I'm, I'm ready to come work for you. And that ended up being a couple years and a couple different boats working on uh, just traditional rig sailing vessels. So are these businesses or are these guys just out having adventures or what? what, what, is, what is it? So... Um, tall ships, they have a variety of ways that they sort of stay operational. Uh, the Mystic Whaler in particular during the springtime will do environmental education as part of the Clearwater program on the Hudson River. So um, anybody that's familiar with the, the Clearwater, which was started by Pete Seeger um, back in the 60s, it's this old Hudson River sloop. Um, the Mystic Whaler will come out in the springtime and each of those boats will work one half of the Hudson river. And then they, every season they trade. So um, when I was on the whaler, we were working the Southern half of the Hudson river. Basically um, I forget what our northernmost point was. I think it was Poughkeepsie. We'd work Poughkeepsie down to uh, New York city. So we were out of like 79th street boat basin. So a lot of environmental education for kids 
um, take them out, do a trawl, bring up some fish, talk about how the Hudson River has gotten cleaner since um, the environmental reg regulations have come through. And then uh, after that, during the summer and fall, there's uh, that boat in particular would run programming uh, passenger work, but also educational sales um, and, and really just kind of like a mix of things, but primarily passenger related work, um, taking people out um, to sail to different islands, you know, like these three day trips or doing like, uh, like sunset cruises. Uh, but other boats I work, you know, I worked on Pride of Baltimore too, that we were a goodwill ambassador for the, um, the port of Baltimore and the state of Maryland. So we would actually go to different ports and, uh, act as ambassadors. All of us on, on the crew were certified tourism ambassadors for, um, for Baltimore. So we would, we would go to different ports, we'd host dignitaries, um, we would do, you know, educational programs, stuff like that. So every tall ship has its own, you know, programming that, that keeps them running. But it wasn't just like a, like a rich person's yacht. Um, it was, it was a working vessel. And um, that's something that I really felt pride in doing, you know, working on a working boat instead of just sort of a, you know, like some sort of leisurely jot for the an ultra wealthy person it was nice to be able to to really do it for a purpose yeah that sounds that sounds really cool so were there times when you get like caught in a storm or like close calls or like when these uh things are like mm -hmm. going across your head is, is there any like um you know generally you try to avoid situations like that. Doing near coastal work, um, the Mystic Whaler generally worked near coastal. Um, prior to Baltimore, would we did uh, get out in like and sail some blue water. That was a much more far ranging vessel. And you know, just like anything, storms come up, and so you deal with storms as they approach. Um, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, when you're out, you, there's no like going into harbor. You just kind of like deal with whatever's coming your way and that's uh, um it can be difficult and it can be um it can be I, I mean there are some moments where you can definitely be like afraid of what you're doing i will say like climbing a rig in a in a storm at like two in the morning um to like 80 feet and trying to like bring in some flogging sail is um you know like there's you're just looking into like this black abyss like up that high you just you're looking down and if you make a mistake if you fall like you can disappear and so working in that environment you're just uh it's yeah it it does it forges a lot of like good character um and i i mean i i think in the moment i kind of in some of those moments there's like second guessing like why why did I sign up to do this? You know, <laughs> but um, you know, retrospectively, I think those are the, those are the moments that really um, were foundational to who I am now. Um, but that's not like the most common occurrence, you know, tall ships aren't going out into storms. They're not like, Oh, Hey, there's a terrible storm coming. Let's like go sail into it. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that is not, part of the modus operandi for most boats. So um, generally they're, they're very safe. Um, you know, like they're, they're safe. You can go on a tall ship. I, I mean, like I, as a person who had never grown up with that sort of thing, I would encourage everybody to go and get on a boat. I mean, there are so many like volunteer opportunities either with like the Clearwater program has great volunteer opportunities or other tall ships just to find out. I mean, like that, that stuff, it a still exists, but also like what the pioneers uh, <laughs> or or like the early seafarers were up against when when they were like crossing oceans. That it's it's an incredible uh, set of skills um, that I think that in modern society we're not aware of uh, quite so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I would... There's some sunshine coming in through this window. Uh, I'm gonna draw this blind real quick. Okay.
There we go. Yeah, I would, I would think that like seeing the stars from the middle of the ocean, no lights on the boat. I've always thought that would be a, a cool thing to check out, just like what the sky looks like. Because in the, I live in Indianapolis, and you know, I've been out country also, but just the, but there's always like some kind of light, or there's some kind of noise. There's a dog barking. There's a car driving by. There's a, but when you're out, I would think in the far out in, in the ocean, and it's nighttime i would imagine the sky looks just unreal it'd be something that you, you only see out there yeah i mean it's it's pretty it's pretty cool you know that you can when you could see the entire sky um from horizon to horizon uh i would i will say like colorado we have a lot of great stargazing so that wasn't for me as like a as like someone who's grown up in close proximity to places with low light pollution. Um, I, what was most fascinating to me about being on the ocean was actually the bioluminescence um, and watching, you know, when you're, when you're under sail, there's no, um, there's no engine. There's not like, you know, with modern shipping, there's an engine constantly going, there's a generator constantly going. So even if you're in the middle of the ocean, there's still noise, but under sail, uh, under sail, it's actually, it's quiet. It's just, you hear the, you hear the ocean, you hear the creaking of the boat. Um, and then when you go down to your bunk, the, the ocean is like right next to your head. <laughs> and like, there's just, you know, just the, the ceilings and the water. Um, so it is, it's, it, there are some amazing moments <laughs> Um, to be had not quite it's not quite as peaceful it's peaceful at times not quite as peaceful at times as people might think because part of seafaring is like a constant vigilance uh, for changes in the weather and changes in the sea state so it's I've always thought that like desert travel was a little bit more relaxing <laughs> than ocean going travel at least from a from a, an operational standpoint I think from a passenger standpoint it's probably same same but operationally like yeah. Seeing the stars is really cool. I mean, and, and that's, you start to learn constellations, you know, you can learn like, oh yeah, like this is, this transits this way. Learning the constellations is a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> were, did you, were you learning how to navigate by the stars? Um, not generally. Um, the, so navigation uh, using an octant or a sextant is, um, still used as a backup, um, like some, I think a lot of boats still keep them on board uh, as a backup, but there are a lot of, um, there, it's mostly done now by chart uh, and GPS. Um, you will take regular plots, you know, on your charts to track your progress. And even in more modern vessels, it's, it's not even done with paper. It's just sort of with the computer. And that's, that's generally the way it goes. It's not quite like, ah, yes, you know, Polaris is that way. We're heading this direction. It's, it's, uh, it's more modern. <laughs> these days. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't want to get lost out there, right? Because left mm -hmm. and right all of a sudden doesn't mean very much if you're in the middle of the ocean and. Yeah. You know, it's, when you look around and, and everything is, is ocean, it's, um, I, I think, uh, there are a lot of people who say like, I couldn't do that. Like that, that feeling of just seeing the same thing for 360 degrees is, is, uh, not, not for them, but you have a compass, you know, you have a compass, you have a chart. Um, those two things, um, really are, I mean, that's, I never felt like we were, you know, we were never lost. No one was ever lost. Sometimes, um, you know, ships have trouble at sea. The, the original Pride of Baltimore um, was laid over in a squall in a, in a microburst event and down flooded. And the crew, uh, the surviving crew spent uh, a couple of, I think it was three days in life rafts until they flagged down a passing cargo ship with a flashlight. And that was in, uh, that was in the mid 80s. So it's not unheard of to be uh, stranded at sea, even in modern era. Uh, but uh, yeah, you don't want to get lost. the The ocean is not 
a place to get lost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, for some that reminded me of, uh, do you know who Ross Edgley is? He swam around Great Britain. Oh, yeah, I believe I've seen some of the video from that, yeah. Yeah, so, um, like, he was, like, there were times, like, they had, um, uh, so they have, you know, the, the professionals that they know the waters, they know the currents, they know the this, and even though they're professionals and they, that's what they do, that's not necessarily what actually happens when you're out there. Mm. And so sometimes he's like swimming and he's trying, but he's not going anywhere or he's trying to go this way, but he's currents taking him that way. And that's not what the science says is supposed to happen, but that's what's happening. And uh, so he, um, but so like with, uh, like the ships and stuff, does that, does that ever happen where you're like looking at the like charts? This is what <laughs> is, this is the direction we're supposed to be going, but that's not what's happening. Is there, I, mean, I don't know anything about sailing obviously, but I wondered if like you're really trying to go that way, but you just can't. Well, you know, with, with, uh, with navigation, uh, good navigation accommodates, um, some of those changes, particularly with sailing. Um, when you're under sail, you're at, you know, not just the whim of the sea state or the current, you're also at the will of the wind. And so, you know, depending on what point of sail you have relative to the wind, it, it will affect which way your boat is going. So if you're trying to sail, let's say like straight this way, but the wind is coming from that direction, you always have to be going in a zigzag pattern towards the wind. And so uh, good seamanship and good navigation um, generally accommodates for uh, things like current, you know, things like the wind, the weather, the sea state, um, and uh, constantly keeping track of where you are um, through plotting your course on a chart. Um, Theoretically, you're going to see if there's some sort of problem and uh, accommodate that problem in your course setting. So if there's a current, say, that's pushing your boat this way, um, but you're trying to get over here, you're going to accommodate for that current by pointing your boat here. So by the time the current is pushing you, but you're going this opposite direction, you'll get to your destination. Um, and that's, you know, those are, those are seamanship skills that are, are learned over time. That's something that, you know, people have been uh, trying to accommodate for hundreds of years. There's such a, a rich history in seafaring uh, that goes back and just trying, you know, the, the sea is not man's domain, you know, it's not <laughs> the domain of humans. And so you really, all you can do is learn how to, um, accommodate its rhythms and its patterns and the fluctuations. And if you're, if you're diligent, you know, you'll get to your destination, but like, you know, like in that documentary, uh, stuff comes up, you know, like it's, it's still the ocean, strange stuff still happens. You know, you still have things that will, that will present unforeseen challenges uh, as you're trying to make it from point A to point B. <laughs> yeah. It's probably a good like metaphor for, like the rest of your life where you want to, you want to go this way. This is what you want to do for a living. This is what, you, but the universe is like knocking you way off course. You got to figure out how to set your uh, metaphorical sails to get, get stay on, on track when it's, it seems like uh, so much is fighting against you. When you're out there, are you, uh, do you, are you keeping a journal? Like when you, cause you were out, what was the longest you were out? Like just on uh -huh. the, Port to port, probably. I we didn't do too big of stretches. Maybe like ten days. Um, I would sign on for six or nine months. But the boat, you know, the boat's job is to be interacting with the public, and so unless you're really trying to get to a, a different continent or something like that, the the ideal is to go and hit as many ports as possible, so that you can actually like be visible and be interacting. You know, a tall ship in the middle of the ocean is great for everyone on board, 
but ultimately that's um, that's not what drives it from a sustainability standpoint. Um, and so, yeah, we were generally um, closer to port to port. So like 10 days out, which is not a long time. Um, my wife is still uh, a professional mariner. She actually works for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And so she'll, she will go out on modern vessels uh, for them for much longer periods of time, um, you know, three, four weeks um, wow. we're in there. And, and that's, you know, that they'll do survey work where they're just kind of making zigzags called mowing the lawn. They just make zigzags back and forth while they chart the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so that for me, it wasn't out, we weren't out 10 days, you know, you just kind of fall into the, the rhythm of things, but that's not too far out really. Well, so they're, they're charting the bottom of the ocean. So are they doing like, like weather stuff too? Like how weather or the climate <clears throat> changes anything to do with that kind of <clears throat> like climate science stuff or yeah the the um so the NOAA ships have a variety of missions um that they undertake some of them are exploratory um studying uh let's say charting the seafloor um or you know checking out uh looking for different sea life some of them are monitoring uh some of its monitoring fisheries so they'll actually go out and they'll uh they'll catch different things, sharks, stuff like that, and say, ah, there's been a de decrease. The scientific side of it is, is not my forte. Um, there, there are scientists on board. Um, she works with the operational side of the vessel. So they'll go to, um, let's say, uninhabited islands and drop off scientists to study um, the effects of uh, the current situations on the populations of animals there. Um, so there is a there is a a wide spectrum of of things that they study. Weather's well, part of it, um, but also what's going on beneath the surface is is also a very large part of it. Yeah, going to these uninhabited islands that sounds that sounds pretty cool. It does. I I haven't. I, that's not what I've I've done. She in those instances uh, she only um, is able to take the scientists up to the shore. She is not allowed to actually get off of the small, uh, the small boat and onto that land. That's specifically like only for scientific uh, study. So she said it's, you know, very cool to, to go up and be in those areas, but she could never legally step off the boat and go onto the island. Huh, it's, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and, and really it's it's to preserve, you know, they're there to preserve the habitat for the animals. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, keeping human in, human involvement and human uh, effect, the effects of humans to as minimal as possible is, is very important. Um, and so even though it might be cool and it might seem like, oh, yeah, it's not a big deal. I'll just like jump up here and take a jaunt down the beach. Um, it's not it's not what's best for the that environment it's not what's best for um those struck those systems those animals uh, so yeah it's they're very it's it's very important it's disappointing sure but important nonetheless yeah if, if somebody was to have like some seed some invasive that would be an invasive species seed stuck in the in the sole of their shoe and it pops out and or some yeah. bacteria or something that hasn't been. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. That would be, uh, that wouldn't be good to wipe out. A <laughs> no, no, that that would completely defeat the purpose of being there in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, like I always like take notes and then I um, forget about them and just like get to talking. Um trying to see if there's anything I was forgetting about. Uh, I want to be like, like recording outside. So you're in, you're in Colorado and when uh, you're like that, we were doing on that, that little Island. And then you said it was like 38 degrees or something like that. And you're walking. So like, what about your finger dexterity? Like uh, what about the actual, <laughs> well, just actually be able to, 
play the cello when it's 38 degrees. Yeah, the the logistics of um, springtime concerts in the mountains here, um, they are always a crapshoot. You know, it can snow a foot in May. Um, when the specific, the instance that you're talking about, so this past, so this would be the end of May, um, beginning of June when that happened. So uh, for lower elevation places, that's very solidly springtime. You know, those are getting to be warm temperatures. But that actually the night before I came to uh, do my setup, for that performance, it snowed four inches. Um, so I was actually, you know, wading out to the island and and trying to get snow, get the snow off of the island. And the air temperatures, I think, thirty eight. The water temperatures like thirty six. Um, <laughs> it's it's cold, um, but the way to accommodate those situations, um, particularly from from a playing standpoint. Um, what I'll do is I will uh, take take gaff tape and hand warmers um, on the insides of uh, my forearm. So where uh, the blood is flowing to my hand, I'll tape a couple of hand warmers on inside each one. And so they're warming the blood up as it's going to my hands. It's not perfect. It's not like playing in the summertime, but... I could still maintain feeling um, in in my hands down to that 38 degree mark. And my my cello, the cello that I use for those performances, is a stalwart instrument. Um, if there are any cellists that are watching <laughs> your podcast, they'd be you know I've gotten this a lot from from other cellists who have. They'll go, I'm really worried about that instrument, but um, that the one that I use for that is a very hardy and. Uh, it's just a stalwart instrument that I've had for a long time. I've played down uh, to zero, um, which is not a temperature that I would recommend anybody to play at. Um, but I've done it, um, and I don't know that I'll do it again down to that temperature. I think uh, 38 is really about my limit of, like, you know, reasonable <laughs> reasonable performance at that temperature it's also you know like it's hard for people to sit mm -hmm. stationary for long periods of time at that temperature um but it's it's possible um it's possible to walk through a 36 degree river to play the cello uh in 38 degree weather at nighttime you can do it um <laughs> if yeah. it, it's 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 totally possible uh <laughs> yeah i would imagine like all the mental toughness and the like concentration that you develop from being 80 feet up messing with sails on the imagine like just that kind of experience and training and then we're like actually this is i can still concentrate where you're not just telling yourself um some kind of unpleasant story the whole time yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, um, I, I guess the way I've tried to conduct my life as a whole and the, as a result, my approach to music is that, you know, where I play and how I play uh, is, is the result of the experiences that I've had in life. Um, I haven't sat inside of a practice room for, you know, the past, you know, eight years. I've, I've been out. I've been doing things and accumulating these uh, these life experiences that are probably outside of uh, the scope of a lot of the players of this instrument. Um, the cold weather, you know, I lived in Breckenridge for uh, seven years and the average snow will fall there is um, 300 inches a year. Um, there's like a solid six months of winter. Like it's, it's winter for, for six months. And while I, while I lived there, I was a, a heavy equipment operator, um, plowing roads, um, running snow plows through the middle of the night. Um, so I'm very familiar with, with cold temperatures and uh, challenging weather conditions, you know, anywhere from like standing at the helm of a boat in the middle of the ocean to like 
driving a road plow through a blizzard. Like I've done that. And so, um, yeah, playing out on an island or playing in some of these situations, definitely not the hardest thing I've done. Um, so when I get into those situations, they can be kind of unpleasant, but it's not like, oh man, this is the most challenging. Like uh, some of the other things I've done, I'm like, eh, I've done harder stuff than this. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. The uh, So do you have like a, a, a method? Like, do you know, like, do you know who Wim Hof is? No. So Wim Hof, he has a bunch of records for um, cold temperature stuff. Like he, he ran a half mile or a half marathon barefoot in the tundra. He's like swam. Uh, like he has the record for swimming underneath ice. Oh wow! Yeah. And, and uh, so he and he'll he'll climb. Uh, uh, Kilimanjaro just with uh, shorts and boots yeah and uh, so he but he has this like breathing method where he can uh, withstand extreme cold temperatures he does heat heat stuff also but he has like this this breathing method and uh, he teaches it to people he's like anybody can can do this if you but uh, it might be, I mean, it sounds like you already have it figured out, but. Oh, I'm, I don't know if I have it figured out. It's like, I think it's just, a, it's just a matter of fortitude on my end. I don't have a method where I'm like, oh, this is pleasant, you know, and <laughs> I've never been like, oh yeah, it's, this is like being at the beach or, or whatever. Um, I, I don't have a method like that. I should look into it. Cause I've actually heard, you know, of, um, monks that have meditated that have uh, been able to you know get their bodies to stay warm in these cold temperatures um i'm not sure that i'm not sure that i'm i'm quite cut out to to maybe pursue that however i mean there is there's actually a a figure skater um that has uh she came to some trio performances and I'd like to do some performances with her out on some frozen mountain lakes. She, she actually treks to these frozen mountain lakes and does figure skating out there. And so uh, I kind of pitched the idea to her of doing it like a duet out there on a frozen lake. So it's probably worth me looking into um, some of those, <laughs> those methods mm -hmm. so that I could make those performances more pleasant for myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds that would be neat to um, uh, play along with that. Yeah, his name's Wim Hof, W I M H O F. Sure. Okay. And uh, yeah, so the method that he does is based on the Tumo, those. That's what the monks that you're talking about, okay. where they'll be out in the Himalayas and they'll be like, no, sure. And they'll make steam come off of there. I've seen that. That's where I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So. He has taken like that method and simplified it, and his method over the years has gotten simpler. And uh, there's a, a Joe Rogan podcast that he's on, and he shows how to do that method. And you can learn a lot about it for free. Uh, so it's I have a buddy that practices it. So he's he does like uh, it'll be thirty some degrees, and he gets in. He goes for a little swim in the. Uh, in a lake and uh, so there's a uh, it it works so it'll, it'll like start off with like cold showers and uh, breathing method in the cold shower and then like little by little but he takes people with just a little training and then they're hiking Kilimanjaro or climbing Kilimanjaro with just shorts and uh, shoes and you mentioned like being on on the beach. He has the, this video because Wim Hof he he plays guitar, and so there's this video of him out s snow all over the place is covered in snow. But he has like this beach chair and he's wearing like these Bermuda shorts and he has like the beach fruity drink beside him and he's he's playing. And he's, he's barefoot and he's dressed like he's on the beach, but it's this frozen, everything's frozen around him. 
and you see him like he goes to take a drink of his and it's frozen solid so it's like it's pretty funny but yeah, so it's like it works and he proves it scientifically at um, a bunch of different universities. So it's not, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to. I would like, I mean, I'd like to pursue that because there's, I'd really love to perform um, on, on an iceberg. That's like uh, something, there was actually a pianist named uh, Ludov Ludovico Ainati who did a performance uh, on an iceberg. And that, that is really, uh, that's a really fascinating concept to me to play in, in one of those spaces. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, I think that there's probably, I'm probably like going to end up doing something like that. Um, logistically planning it is, is really just the big challenge, I think. Um, but some of those techniques, I'll look into those because, um, yeah, I'll probably end up in a situation where, where they'll be beneficial to me at some point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what, what it can do. And so you mentioned the trio. So you, you have a couple other musicians, that, uh, mandolin and a, a violin. Yeah. Um, the mandolinist uh, is Kevin Larkin and the violinist is Karen Laufer. Um After I had done, uh, my initial performances up in the tree. Uh, I approached those two and asked them if they'd like to come and play with me. Um, and I specifically approached them because I appreciate their musicianship, but also their creative and adventurous spirits. And uh, they agreed. And so we've been doing, we've been performing as trio, just sort of like, every now and then because we all have our own separate uh endeavors uh for maybe f i don't know like four years every now and then we'll pick up gigs i mean we're all professionals so we don't have to like have lots of rehearsal time we'll all write compositions i think maybe half of what we play in trio is mine and then those two have also contributed uh pieces so we'll write compositions for the three of us and then they'll climb up there with me and play. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun because it, you know, with, with extra musicians, it expands the tonal possibilities uh, of a performance. And so playing with them is a lot of fun. And, and you know, we're all, we're all really good improvisers too. So we'll do, um, so we'll actually uh, improvise stuff as a trio on the spot. Um, most of what we do is, is composed because it's just fun to write compositions for it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's, there are two other musicians joining me up in the trees currently, um, yeah. which is great playing with them. Yeah. And do you, I looked at like, your concert dates. It was the, I think it, I just saw like the list of past ones. Are, are you mainly just doing stuff around Colorado or do you guys travel around too? Yeah. I mean, we, if the logistics are possible, we'll do it. Kevin, um, Kevin used to be based out of Colorado and now he's based out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. So it complicates um, what we do just a little bit more. Primarily these performances, you know, like these performances have been held in Colorado, but recently there's been uh, attention nationally speaking um, that have, had some inquiries come in from really places around the country. I think uh, as far south as the Florida Keys, uh, as far north as uh, Montreal, uh, Vancouver, uh, up in Oregon, Washington, uh, up in Wisconsin. So there's like these, uh, like nationally, I think that there will be more dates. Right now I'm sort of trying to figure out the summer schedule um, for those things as, as temperatures get warmer. Um, so yeah, it's been primarily Colorado, but you know, people, people seem, you know, as long as there's somebody that, that wants us to come and play and we can make the logistics of it work out, um, you know, I'm game, you know, and the other two, it just depends on their schedules if they can participate as well. Um, so it's always just, you know, it's, yeah, if it's out there, you know, if it's possible, or, or maybe even if it if it doesn't seem possible, we'll take a look at it. And, and yeah, uh, like an iceberg. I think if you're thinking like, oh, I think I'll do it on this iceberg. If 
Mm-hmm. Somebody, yeah, there's uh, a- what your idea of what's possible is <laughs> probably pretty wide. Um, have you thought of like live streaming? Do you ever what, live stream these so people all over the world could? Um, yeah, I usually I don't personally think of that stuff. Sometimes other people will do it, but there's a lot um, personally that I'm sort of handling logistically speaking. And so audio and and video streaming, I think is a great idea, but has not really been a part of um, (laughs) my planning process because I've got a a lot of other moving pieces, you know, not just, I think if it was just, just me as a, like performance wise, if all I had to do was say, walk out on a stage and sit down and play, it's, I wouldn't have to be accommodating so much. um, I wouldn't have to be accommodating so much other stuff, but right now I, my plate's a little bit full. So setting up streaming (laughs) and audio gets kicked way down to the, to the lowest parts of those. I, from what I understand, you know, people will take videos, people take videos and share them around like Instagram or Facebook. And, and that's really cool. It's really interesting to see afterwards, but um, I should probably get, uh, that side of things up to speed because I think it would be it would be good. People have been demanding uh, video and audio <laughs> of recent performances. Like I played the state capitol um, a couple days ago mm-hmm. for the uh, lighting of the holiday tree. And you know, there's like all the all of the leadership from the state, the governor and the lieutenant governor, and like the all of the military brass are there from around the state. But I. I mean, like in those moments, like I'm more just focused on playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as as it grows, it'll it'll be easier to whether financially or otherwise, just say point to you know pick somebody to do all the other stuff for you, so you can just show up and play. Cause yeah, I, I'd love. I mean, I would love. I'd love to uh, incorporate that as part of our performance uh, stuff for trio as part of my individual performances. Um, you know, we've had some good film stuff recent at the last, in August, there was a, um, there was a group that, I wouldn't say a group, but um, an artist named Bruce Oddland came and recorded some of my solo performance, but he recorded it in 360, um, both audio and video. And so um, it was part of this. So it then was projected inside of a dome. Um, so if you've been to like a, like a science museum where they have a planetarium um, where you can like lie back in a chair and see all the stars, um, a lot of those spaces are starting to do um, like musical performance or projection. So one of those performances was actually projected in a dome so you look up and it's like you're in the forest and I'm there and then the audio is in surround sound as well Um, so I think that as technology sort of gets towards uh, as technology progresses I think those immersive experiences particularly in streaming format are going to be a lot more common and I think it would be a lot of fun to incorporate the technological aspect into uh, the natural performances albeit you know, getting everything out there and live streaming from a forest or a cave or a river or whatever. Um, that's its own thing. But I think it'd be, I mean, it'd be really cool to do that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's getting more and more popular. I was watching like Billy strings. Mm-hmm. If you've ever heard of him, just a ridiculously awesome guitar player. Yeah. And uh, I was watching his live stream. He had, like the first set you could watch for free on YouTube and then, or you could sub- sub- subscribe for like, it's like a dollar a month or something oh, like yeah. that. And I've or, or something like that. What's like, that? Like, uh, like, like on Twitch or there, I know that there are some, some script subscription channels like that. Yeah. 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 And it's like, I've watched like grateful dead live stream. And so I, I think that's getting more, more and more popular and so that that would be cool to be able to just press a button and there you are from from anywhere yeah it's interesting like uh seeing 
like when I see the map of the, like who listens to this show and it's been, it's probably over a hundred countries on, on one of my uh, analytics, it says 99 countries oh, wow. and that doesn't count like YouTube and uh, other. So it's, it's probably more than a hundred, but just right. to see the map where people have heard the show and maybe like it's, it's one person in, you know, Guatemala listens for 12 seconds or something. So that'll make the whole country light up. So it's not like, but still it's, it's cool to see. So I'd yeah. imagine something like what, what you're doing too, to like, even though you're at this like one spot and there's, I don't know how many people are coming to your, your shows, but to see it just like, really go all over the world, I think would be awesome for you. Yeah. I, I, I would like to incorporate that. I mean, it, it is, um, I think, you know, in our biggest shows, we're probably seeing like with, with trio, we would probably see three to 400 people out. Wow. And that's, you know, that's with a little bit more of a promotional sense during like the, the, uh, the Breck International Festival of Arts. Um, and so that's a more formal festival. The, the solo performances that I do that are just pop-up concerts, sometimes they're impromptu. So I don't see like, generally speaking, I'm not like reaching 400 people like <laughs> wherever I go, maybe some point, but doing, um, doing it as a live stream, I think would be really, I think that would be really cool. You know, just to, you know, kind of at least give a window into this this setting mm -hmm. if, if it can't be immersive at least there's a small window into it yeah yeah and there's something about these like the have not having very many people there uh, i went to go see khaki king at this uh she's one of my favorite guitar players mm -hmm. she's just amazing she's like she's like banging on the guitar and she she could you can tell from her playing, she could play anything classical or flamenco that she wanted to, but she has her own way. And I'm going to her. So she, to me, she's like this guitar goddess. Like, and I go to see her play. I've seen her a couple times. And, and there was only like 20 some people there, 30 some, 30 people. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, she's this, but it was kind of cool. Cause it was, it was almost like we were just at this, like, it was at this um, concert venue, but it was almost like we, everybody was just kind of like hanging out too. Cause she was like talking to us. Like you would just talk to your bunch of friends that like people come to see you at this party and you're just like, kind of like talking to people. And so it was kind of like that. So it was kind of cool, but it was also like, why isn't this place packed? Like, I, but well, I could, I mean, part of the, I will say that as a performer, you know, one of the, the great things and for what I, for what I do with the nature performances, it's really, um, you know, it being accessible as a musician is, is something that is very important to me. Um, the cello in particular sometimes is um, unfairly burdened with this sort of like rarefied air you know not a lot of people have interacted with it sometimes um the performers can be um inaccessible and seem remote um from from the audience and one of the great things that i love doing about these performances is that it's not you know i'm not apart it's it's just one moment that we're all sharing together um and i love interacting those intimate concerts i love I love just interacting with the audience and, and talking with people and, you know, sort of like I was talking about earlier with um, the way I started cello. I'm, I'm, you know, if anybody ever like wants to come up and try, you know, I'm like, yeah, sure. Like give it a shot, you know, you try and pull, pull a, like pull the bow across the string. I'm all about passing that first moment of interaction that I had, you know, that I still remember as a kid, pet, paying that forward to the next generation or even adults. Like I think I, I, um, the first time I met the previous, um, the previous governor of Colorado, I actually like, uh, taught him 
sort of how to play the jazz theme on the cello, that sort of lurking theme. Um, so yeah, those intimate concerts, I mean, uh, yeah, we're, I don't think that a lot of, you know, there are a lot of performers out there. We're not, we're not, you know, some sort of like mythical behind closed doors sort of people. It's just, it, it's good to interact with people. I mean, ultimately, at least speaking for myself, I'm out there to, to connect with folks, you know, to make some sort of emotional connection through, you know, with music and hopefully they connect to the music as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, facilitating that in multiple ways is important. Wherever I go, I've, I'm always about doing like community, you know, community events, community interaction. That's, that's something that I think is really important. Um, just about, you know, humanizing this sort of stuff. Again, like the cello is just an, it's, it's just an instrument. It's not like, it's not inaccessible. It's not like it's, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. uh, untouchable. You know, I'm, I'm always like, yeah, give it a shot. Like see what it's about. I mean, it's, it's pain in the butt to learn for sure. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's still there just like a guitar is or a piano or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I like listening to it. it. It's, it's really cool. And I've listened to quite a bit on, on your YouTube channel and I was listening to it this morning while I was getting my notes ready and everything. So, um, like what's, what's next for you? Like, what do you, do you have, um, we can start to uh, wrap it up here. I don't want to take all of your, your Sunday up. Um, but do, is there, um, uh, uh, anything you're wanting to cover that we, we didn't get to or like what's, what's next for you? And, um, the, what's next winter time tends to be generally slow. I don't do any outdoor bookings. Um, I don't do a lot of outdoor bookings for, uh, winter because it's, I don't want to be in the snow <laughs> playing. Um, you know, like again, it's just unpleasant to play in the cold, but, um, the what's coming up i mean like this week i'll actually be playing uh, myself and an aerialist a group of aerialists um we'll be playing um we're doing a uh we're we're playing a concert like an elementary for an elementary school in, in an underprivileged part of denver um which is really exciting so i'm accompanying them on their aerial silks with the cello um the the most stuff is sort of coming up uh, in springtime, there's a few things that I do. I stay busy with recording projects here. Um, I get involved with other projects um, as a sideman for bands um, in lots of different genres and lots of different instruments. So that's kind of how the, the winter is for me. But the next thing right now that would be on the books, um, the river performances are coming up in... Um, end of May, early June. I've been talking with uh, an organization in Montreal, so I might have some performances in April um, or thereabouts before it gets too muggy and before the bugs sort of start to come out. So maybe there, Montreal or Key West, uh, not Key West, just the Florida Keys in general. Um, those are sort of irons in the fire, but um, really it's, it's what December now. So I'm just trying to figure out the summer schedule. Um, and if the weather's nice enough down here, I do do like, I'll go out and just do impromptu sets and places that I like to play. So it's always kind of fun to, to do like, Hey, this, I'll be out here tomorrow. You know, if the weather looks good and yeah. <laughs> get people out. Yeah. That's, that's really neat. It's, it's such a cool idea. And just to be out walking through the woods. I spend a, a fair amount of time in the woods. I'll probably be out in the woods somewhere today, up in, up in a tree somewhere. Oh. And so if, if I just like hear like a cello playing or something that, that, that would be awesome to, to check that out. And let's see. Yeah. I, um, we can, we can wrap it up here. Uh, what's, uh, how do people, uh, find your, um, information like you have like your, your YouTube channel, if you have like, Instagram, Facebook. Yep. Um, I mean, my handle on, on all of those is just Russick Smith, R U double S I C K, uh, S M I T H. Um, I've got, 
uh, a record coming out, probably uh, looking at releasing it mid-January. Um, sometime that's all original compositions, uh, cello, bass, mandolin, banjo, and guitar. Um, there are two singles from that that are up on Spotify right now and uh, another one on the way. So those are, that's, uh, that's pretty much what's going on over the next couple of, couple of months um, in terms of contact. I'm always writing small vignettes. Like if I'm not, if I don't have stuff going on, I'll wake up and I'll record um, new pieces um, just as sort of an exercise for myself. But um, I usually will post those on my SoundCloud or my, uh, to YouTube or to Instagram. Um, those are the, the three. So yeah, Facebook and Instagram are the big ones for me and uh, SoundCloud to a certain extent as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I like, I listened to a bunch of those. Like there are some, a lot of them like just a minute and some long. Yeah. Just like That's these, like, just like these, just like musical ideas and just, it gets summed up ni nice and easy. It's not like, okay, this song has to be three minutes long or, it's just, yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a cool way to do things. So it's just, a, it's just a snapshot and I play all the instruments on them, you know, like it's, it's easy enough for me to like, I have my own, you know, modest recording space here. So I'll do these compositions that are usually about, mm, usually either duets to like quintets. Um, and I'll just like turn them out in the morning, like, Oh yeah, nothing's going on this morning. You know, record this, like write this composition and then I'll get on with my day and, and take care of some of the other stuff that I need to do. So those are always, I don't, I don't have a set schedule for those, but they're constant. Like it's just constantly popping up if I have time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. It's inspiring for, for me to, to play more too. I, I try to play guitar at least like a half hour a day, but I, I don't always. And yeah. So just always like looking for new, inspiration i don't it's been a long time since i've taken my guitar outside anywhere to play so I'm, um it's a little, little cold for like the finger dexterity stuff now but, but yeah it's definitely inspiring to see people doing doing what you're doing something different and exciting and uh so yeah well i will uh i'll uh, let you go i'll stop the recording and then i'll talk to you for just a second after um i stop the recording yeah, thanks for being on. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure.